So let us begin with let us begin with prayer. O Holy Spirit, through your precious word and sacrament, you have made our hearts your home. How wonderful it is that you have placed us into the fellowship of thousands of like-minded brothers and sisters. Hinder every one of Satan's efforts to destroy this blessed fellowship. Keep our focus upon your message and your mission. Bless all the work we carry out together in your precious name. Amen. So our Bible study is before us in the folders that you find there. And Lord willing, I indented the sides enough on the computer so that um, it does not interfere with being able to read what is there in there. I think I did this time. Um, and as you see there, as you to open up to the first page, um, I'm going to try to each section that we go through, um, offer up a, a passage, a, a memory verse worth memorizing. Um, the better and the more that we can commit God's word to memory, um, the better it's going to be. And I know that our, our first reaction is school anymore. And my second reaction is, but my brain doesn't work that way anymore. And I encourage you that actually our brains can um, and even though we're not in school, we can still take time throughout the week of just kind of refreshing it. No one's going to come and ask you whether or not you learned it and have you memorize it and say it to me and I'll mark it on a, on a little chart or anything. Nobody's going to do that. No stickers. <laughs> but just, just an encouragement. And then also is each section is, is sectioned off but we're not going to rush, um, and we're not going to seek to make sure that we get through each section each time. Um, we will go at a pace that works for, for us to be able to study this, this section that's before us and the book of 1 Corinthians um, in, in somewhat of a, a deeper dive as we consider what it is that the Apostle Paul says to us here, and even more so what the Holy Spirit says to us through through the Apostle Paul. Yes? Are we keying in just on the second missionary journey? Nope, we're keying in on the book of First Corinthians. Oh. Yep, which is why if you look there at the top, our first section, First Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, is going to really be studied under the theme, Forgiveness and Power for Improvement. So, let us begin there with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> and we'll see how this works as we go along. I, I know that there are, are many who like to be able to write a lot of things down. Um, I'm going to say some things. I'm not so sure that you'll be able to write everything that I say down in every aspect of the notes section. Um, perhaps it'll be a case as we go along, we'll morph into a, a case of where I fill in and some, and then you fill in more. But um, this opportunity for us kind of to focus on, on different aspects, different words, and I'll say some other things as we read um, those sections as well. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, who are called as saints, along with all in every place, who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we, we hear those words, peace, God, Father, Lord Jesus Christ, so frequently it's easy to kind of just gloss over them. Um, why is it that God is our Father? It's not just because he made us. It is because he is our Father through faith in Jesus Christ. And so keep that in mind whenever you hear that term Father as well. So right off the bat, you see that the Apostle Paul establishes his rank and authority as an apostle. 
Um, it was very important for him to establish that rank and authority as the apostle because right here in the book of Corinthians, throughout it, he's going to say some very, very strong words. He is going to rebuke the Corinthians. He is going to correct the, the, the Corinthians. Um, and you can just imagine um, the Corinthians may be saying, well, what authority do you have to be saying these things to me? And so right off the bat, um, and look at what he says about this establishing his rank and authority as apostle. First, he calls himself an apostle. Then he states that he's been called by God to be an apostle. And then he says it's God's will that he be the apostle. I mean, he stresses that, that, that rank. He stresses that authority um, in, in many different ways there. And the reason is, and we'll see it in just a few moments, um, this congregation had some folks who were, who were in it who were opposing the Apostle Paul. They were opposing him, um, attacking him, and attacking his ministry. And, and so really, you think about what the Lord said to his disciples, to his apostles. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The Apostle Paul is really basically saying you should listen to me. And if you don't listen to me, you're actually guilty of not listening to Jesus Christ. We also see the name Sosthenes. Um, we will come across that name in just a few moments as we read about the founding of the Corinthian congregation. Uh, it is possible, quite likely, but we can't say with absolute certainty, that the Sosthenes here is the same Sosthenes that we'll read about in just a few moments. Um, but why is he included here? Quite possibly, he is dictating what the Apostle Paul is saying. And then the Apostle Paul will basically put his name, his signature, on that, on that letter. Um, you could say a scribe. And then we see that he's writing to the, the congregation in Corinth. Um, you'll see the map there down below, and you'll see that, that Corinth was, um, the congregation was established on the Apostle Paul's second miss missionary journey. Um, you'll see the arrows. If you look for Corinth there, you'll find Corinth in the um, upper left side. Um, if you see Sencrea on that, it almost looks like an island. It's not. There's a little arrow that goes over a little tiny isthmus. Um, that isthmus was actually quite important because it was quite dangerous to travel all the way down the side of Greece, which is, that, that's Greece there, Macedonia, Achaia, that's, that's Greece. It was dangerous to go all the way down um, by boat below that area. So they'd go into that little channel, and oftentimes they'd stop at Corinth, and they'd unload their ships, take it across that small little isthmus, and then load ships on the other side. So they didn't go down below. So you can see that Corinth was actually a rather um, busy place of, of commerce. Um, it actually was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire in the first century Rome. Um, it was estimated to be a city of around 200,000 people. That's not counting what was considered to be probably about 500,000 slaves. So you're, you're talking perhaps that in there about 700,000 people. Um, and it was a center of, of Greek culture um, in, that, in that day. Today, if you were to go to Corinth, you'd find Corinth around 22,000 people. Um, it is not nearly as large anymore. Um, when we think of Greek culture, we probably think of the city of Athens first. Um, but Corinth was very much um, a city of culture as well. Um, it is said that there may have been well over a thousand prostitutes at the shrine of Aphrodite um, in Corinth in its heyday. And, and so it was a place of, of a lot of immorality, a lot of excess. Um, you even would go so far as to say that they, they, they made kind of a, a word um, to be Corinthianized, 
was, was just a word that was used to talk about how people um, were, were caught up in all of the vices in the city of Corinth. Um, and so, so here the Apostle Paul is writing to individuals here, um, and, and you can see that they're starting to slip a little bit back into their old ways as he's writing. And then, along with all in every place, um, take note of that. You know, we, we don't always maybe pay attention to those little phrases, but um, notice the all. It, it indicates that the letter is written for more than just the Corinthians to read. Um, this letter was meant to be circulated, along with all in every place, and then understand we can see ourselves in that all as well. Um, it's for us to be reading as well. And so the reason for writing this letter is because of the problems that arose. There were a number of them. Divisions in the congregation, an ugly case of sexual immorality, marriages were in trouble, the understanding and practice of the Lord's Supper was distorted, they were confused and uncertain about the resurrection of the body and the life to come. They had a bad attitude, and they had become intellectually and spiritually arrogant. Um, you really could kind of say that the first bloom of their faith was starting to wear off. Um, and, and I think that's a, a valuable thing to keep in mind, too, is that whether we're talking about ourselves, maybe we're talking about an individual that is recently come into our, into our congregation um, and, and has come out of, of a sinful lifestyle, um, or whether it be somebody that we're witnessing to or a friend, is Satan loves to work really, really hard on those that, that Christ has just brought into the fold. Um, because he can't stand that he's lost one, and so it works really hard. Um, it's really a reminder of the need for, for mature Christians to be actively assisting, mentoring those who maybe are just coming into the faith. Um, because there's always going to be that temptation. There's for us too, but always that temptation to slip back into those ways in which they, which they came. All right, let's look at the founding of the church in Corinth. Uh, so this next section comes from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 17, and we, we, get in a, we get the really account of the church of Corinth being established. I know that there's 17 verses there, but would someone like to read those 17 verses? Go ahead, Dave. Titius Eustus. Titius Eustus, a worshiper of God. Christus, the synagogue ruler, and the entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night the Lord has woke the fall of the vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent. I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into the court. This man, in charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle down yourself. 
And there we come across that name again, Sosthenes. Um, and like I said, very likely um, the same Sosthenes that we see here. So it would be a case that he had come to faith, and perhaps he then, then joined, joined the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul is writing this letter from Ephesus. Um, and so he hears about the problems there, um, and he writes this letter to them. One, the one thing of note, um, we just get this little background of, of how it was started, but one thing of note is the Apostle Paul spent more time in Corinth than he did in almost any of the other places when he established the congregation. Um, we hardly ever hear of the Apostle Paul staying for something like 18 months. That's how long he stayed, a year and a half in Corinth as he established. It was a lot more often that he went there. He was there a shorter amount of period of time and moved on. And so he, he did get to know these, these believers very well. He got to know them in a very intimate way, which also may lend one to see why he was able and felt so comfortable to write as strongly as he did to them as well. Because he writes some very, very strong words. Um, you'll even see that you know, he uses some good old sarcasm um, as he writes to them also. So turning the page, um, we see question number two. What do the following passages reveal about how Paul learned about some of the problems in the church at Corinth? Um, would someone like to read the First Corinthians 1, 11 passage? Go ahead, Rudy. So how did he find out? Some people from Chloe's household came. Some of the Chloe's people. First Corinthians 7, verse 1a, we hear. Go ahead, Nancy. So what did the congregation in Corinth do? They sent a letter to the Apostle Paul. Um, so they, he received a request from the Corinthian congregation itself asking for some help, for some counsel. And then 1 Corinthians 16 says, I am glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus came because they supplied what was lacking on your part. Um, so three, it would appear, members of the Corinthian congregation, more than likely the ones delivering the letter to the Apostle Paul, came to him, and he would have had opportunity to speak with them. So what's going on in the congregation? How's the congregation doing? Um, is there, and, and maybe even after reading the letter, he said, well, could you explain this even, even more to me? What is interesting, um, and not to confuse you, but what is interesting is 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is actually 3 Corinthians. Um, but that's right here in this little box. So, so Paul was in Ephesus when he heard about the problems in Corinth. So he visited them. We hear about that in 2 Corinthians. This visit didn't resolve the problem, so he wrote a letter. This letter, however, was not preserved. We hear about that letter in 1 Corinthians 5. The Corinthians replied with a letter brought to Ephesus. After receiving that letter, Paul responded with the letter we know as 1 Corinthians. It is an interesting letter, a practical letter, a letter much needed by Christian churches today. Um, the congregation established about 52 AD. A um, letter written probably somewhere between 55 to 57 AD or actually I believe it's proper AD 55, 57. I think it goes beforehand, doesn't it? Um, and then the BEC is supposed to come afterwards, but I'm not positive. A couple of digger, digging deeper questions of this section um, before we move on to our next portion. What makes a church a Christian congregation? Rachel. One that's built on Christ. Evan. Wherever two or three come together in my name, in Jesus, there I am with them. Wherever one or two come together in my name, or two or three come together in my name, there I'm with them. Um, and what do they need to be gathering around? You, you hinted at it, you, you spoke to it. Christ, um, 
what makes a Christian congregation is a gathering or assembly of people around God's word and the sacraments. And, and right there in verses, verses 1 to, to 3, you, you really have a case of, of a reference to both a local congregation as well as the aspect of um, the Holy Christian Church. Um, if you think about that, to the church of God in Corinth. I'm speaking to this local congregation. But then at the end of verse 2, along with all in every place who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. That's a reference to the Holy Christian Church. Um, it's interesting in the Greek language, um, the word church isn't church the way we think of it. Um, it's really a called out ones. That's what the Greek is. That's what makes a church. Those who've been called out of the darkness of unbelief into the light of faith. Um, that's, that's what we find as we look at that, that Greek language. Um, and, and so you could say, the church is a gathering of people who have responded to that call, that calling out of. And point B, or question B, knowing what we do about the congregation, what can we learn from the way Paul addresses them? I mean, just stop and think about it. We talked about um, marriage was in trouble. So Paul spends a lengthy section in, in 1 Corinthians talking about marriage. Um, there was a bad case of sexual immorality. So he spends time talking about church discipline. There was a misunderstanding of the sacrament of communion. And so he spends two chapters talking about the proper understanding of it. And when we get to that, it'll be very eye-opening. The Holy Spirit inspires the Apostle Paul to say very clearly, some people have died because you've abused the sacrament. Very clearly says it. Um, and so all of these problems, and yet look at how he addresses them. What can we learn? Rudy. Very familiar. There is one verse, it's, it's missing, um, but yes, he does. Um, it's a question that will come up here in a few moments. That's, that's quite all right. Um, but he does, he uses Jesus Christ a lot. Um, what does he call them? Saints. He deals with them very, very evangelically. And when I, I use that term evangelically, um, with the gospel driving him. Um, that's what evangelical means. It means gospel-centered. Um, that's why we have the name Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church. That's why we have the Synod Wisconsin Evangelical Synod, um, Lutheran Synod, because it's gospel-centered. I mean, he deals with them very evangelically. Um, he finds reason, we'll see in the next section, to give thanks to God for them. Um, he's not down on them. He still calls them saints. And, and here's the reason I ask the question. It's very important for us to not lose sight that Christians who struggle with sin and problems is not to lose sight that they are still Christians. Um, the Apostle Paul very much looks at these individuals, even with all their problems, as Christians. And he deals with them as Christians. And, and so it's important for us not to lose sight of that too. Um, we might see somebody fall again and again and again. Um, and they may come back again and again and say, I shouldn't have done that and I can't stand that I do that. Um, we're still dealing with Christians. Um, so may we deal very evangelically with them too. Um, that'll keep us from having a bit of the um, superior, arrogant mind mindset that the Corinthians ended up having. Um, and I'll pause at the end of each section, um, and it happens if there is a question that comes up in the, in the verses that we read, um, kind of scan the, the room, but if there's nothing there, I will continue on. 
And so after identifying them as Christians, now he goes on to identify a very serious problem in their midst. <clears throat> so verses 4 to 17. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. You were enriched in him in every way, in all your speaking and all your knowledge. Um, you know, that grace of God, there, there's no greater blessing than that. Um, you know, a, a Christian has a certainty that no unbeliever can ever know. And what is, what is the Apostle Paul saying? That certainty that the believer has affects what you say and what you know. Um, and that's his idea. In, in all your speaking, um, that would be in the, the ability to express, the ability to communicate um, the, the gospel message that they've come to know in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Uh, this wisdom that, about spiritual things that's revealed by, by the cross of Christ um, through the Holy Spirit. So, you were enriched in him in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because the testimony about Christ was established in you. As a result, you do not lack any gifts as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also keep you strong until the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a promise eight is. Um, he'll keep you blameless. He'll keep you to the end, so you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and why can, why can we be, be confident of verse seven and eight? Because of the beginning of verse nine. God is faithful. Um, there is the reason that we can have that confidence. God is faithful, who called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Brothers, I am making an appeal to you using the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you all express the same view and not have any divisions among you, but that you be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For the news I heard about you, my brothers, from members of Chloe's household, is that there are rivalries among you. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that I baptized you into my own name. I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Besides them, I do, not be, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom used in speeches, so that the cross of Christ would not be emptied of its power. And as he says there, for Christ did not send me to baptize, um, he's not saying that baptism is unimportant. We're going to come across that again in a later question. Um, he's simply really basically saying the associates of mine are, are able to do that. Um, preaching the gospel, dealing with these controversies, that's going to consume my time. Um, like I said, though, we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about that. So, so here we see the, him say, my will is that you express the same view and have no divisions. How is that able to be brought about? It's able to be brought about only when it's based on all of God's word. Um, the illustration that I perhaps have seen that, that perhaps brings this across most um, effectively in my mind is the idea of a chain link chain. A chain link chain is made up of many small links, isn't it? But if one of those links is taken out in the middle, you no longer have the chain. So let's take, for example, now all of a sudden that chain link is, chain is your lifeline. Um, you're over a cliff. Um, and you're hanging on to this chain. And somebody comes and takes one link out in the middle. What happens to you? Um, that chain is no longer any good because now you fall to your death. Well, if you think about each of the teachings of God's word as being one of the links, 
Um, it makes up, though, one chain. This is the reason why the Lord could say, when speaking to the Jews, if you hold to my teaching, not teachings, but if you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth. Um, why? Because it's a chain. It's, it's all one thing. From beginning to end, the Bible is a unit. And yet, at the same time, he could say, when he gives the command to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Um, now he's referencing each of the links. Um, that's the only way that unity can truly exist. Um, and, and Christ filling our lives is the formula to this, to this unity. So, so what would that look like? Um, well, here's maybe the application is a unity in all of God's word then also looks at others within that fellowship, not on tears. As if somebody here, down here, is, is not really quite as united with me because they're not quite as spiritually mature as I am. Um, that's not at all the type of unity that, that God is talking about. We want to see all the members, so to speak, on the same playing field. Ultimately, we deny the truthfulness of God if we tolerate unscriptural truths amongst our midst and then say that we have un unity with somebody in the faith. Now let's take a look at, at these, these gentlemen that, that the Apostle Paul speaks about. So Apollos was a Jew from Alexandria, a learned man well versed in the Bible. He came to Ephesus and later to Corinth and preached there with great passion. But Apollos was not acquainted with the baptism as Jesus had commanded, so Aquila and Priscilla took him into their home to instruct him. We read about that in Acts chapter 18. Cephas is just the Aramaic name for Peter. Um, and then we, we know Paul and we know Christ. Um, then the Apostle Paul says, I do not know if I baptized anyone else. Um, there might be uh, somebody who, oh, well, what in the world? Isn't this inspired scripture? How can he say, I don't know if I, I baptized anybody else? Um, consider this comment. The way in which Paul lists the people whom he baptized does not diminish the truth that God inspired this letter. When Paul mentioned Crispus and Gaius, he was thinking of people in Corinth whom he had baptized. Stephanus did not come to mind at first because Paul did not baptize him in Corinth. A verse like this indicates that inspiration was not a mechanical process. God used people with their unique personalities and guided them to write down exactly what he wanted. Um, and so this doesn't cause any concern about verbal inspiration. It actually just highlights the fact that this wasn't a case of these, these writers closing their eyes and holding a quill pen and then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit moves them. Uh, he used their own individual, their own unique abilities. And so they wrote in this matter. Um, and so I don't remember if I did. Oh, yes, right. I, I also baptized Stephanus as well. Um, so let's search the scripture. Um, count how many times the name of Christ is mentioned in verses 1 to 10. I'll give you a moment. Verses 1 to 10. What'd you come up with? More. Ten. There's ten. Um, and it's it's in every sentence, not in every verse. Um, so if you look at verse five, you see that there's no Christ in verse five. Um, but every every sentence has it in. Um, there is nowhere else. 
in the entire Bible that Christ is referred to in that many consecutive verses like that. So why? Um, what message is Paul sending with this frequent naming of Christ? Evan. And it's, not, and it's not just um, to emphasize an authority, though, either. There's even more to it there as well. Mark. That everyone is part of Christ's body. Okay. Everyone is, is part of Christ's body. And so you're thinking perhaps in the aspect of, of this division that has, has um, grown there and, and realizing this aspect of, of Christ's body. Um, and, and certainly not... You're, you're not far off, especially when you consider later on. Um, it's, it's in 1 Corinthians that we come across that lengthy section that talks about the body of Christ, right? Um, but we can even see, you can even see more. Uh, the spiritual divisions that had taken place amongst them, and their challenging the apostles' authority, demonstrated an arrogance on the part of the Corinthians. And so what does he want them to see? Everything that you have as a Christian, everything that you are, is from Christ. What do you have to be arrogant about? He gives all of the credit to God. And he's wanting to lead those Corinthians to see what in all of the world would I be arrogant over when everything and who I am is all a result of God's work in me? And, you know, some people will say that the Apostle Paul is, is um, demonstrating um, marvelous diplomacy um, as he starts out with such a, a, a kind way before he jumps into into his rebuke. But it's actually more than that. Um, what he's really trying to do is say, the answer to all of your problems is Jesus. Every last one of them is Jesus. He's not simply trying to soften the blow. He's saying, Jesus is for your forgiveness. Um, Jesus is there for your strength. Jesus is there for your proper understanding. Jesus is the one who's going to give you motivation. Jesus is the source of your, your salvation. And as we talked about with the overarching theme, Jesus is your power for improvement. Um, that's what he's emphasizing here. Um, and, and, and think about this in application to, to ourselves as well. Sometimes we have a tendency to be too preoccupied with our weaknesses and our failures, and we ignore our new life. And it can kind of go like this. Well, I'm never going to be perfect anyway, so why even try? But what does Paul, as he begins this way, what is he emphasizing? Although perfection is not going to be possible for us, improvement by grace is. Um, although perfection is not going to be possible for us, improvement by grace is when we keep everything focused on Christ. And, and so the Apostle Paul is really saying to him, you've got a lot of things going for you. Christ has forgiven your sins, and he can help you do better. That's biblical motivation. Um, that's what he's doing. He's not just exercising diplomacy. Um, he's giving them biblical motivation. Yes, Rudy? Yeah, he's got support there. My eyes just happened to glance down for the first time. God is faithful. Yeah. Uh, the he is. He is. 
Um, question two, what kind of division had developed in the congregation? Annette. Exactly. So the members were rallying around the leaders rather than around the gospel, weren't they? And, and even those who said, I follow Christ, what can you just sense from the way the Apostle Paul says it and in the connection he says it? That there were the individuals who say, well, yeah, you follow all those ones. Well, I follow Christ and I'm even more superior to you than, than all your superiority aspects. Perhaps this leads to just a little bit of an offshoot question. Um, do, do members overrate their pastors and spiritual leaders still today? Rachel? In what ways might we see it? Dave? Um, yeah, it can, it can be demonstrated in that, that regard. Um, I, remember, I remember preaching once um, a, a sermon series on the ministry of the keys and, and an individual coming out of the church saying, yeah, pastor, I understand what you said in the sermon, but um, I think you're, you're the pastor for us. And, and I said, um, then you didn't really listen to my sermon. Um, and... And I think that one of, the, one of the saddest things is when sometimes a pastor takes a call and you find a member no longer coming to church because they did end up becoming attached to the leader rather than the gospel proclaimed there. And so there's always that need of understanding um, it's not about the leader, it's not about the pastor, um, it's about the gospel that is proclaimed. Were you going to say something more? And there needs to be, um, I cannot speak to it from experience outside of the fact that um, as, as your third year vicar, you serve in a capacity where there's, where there's a, a pastor and then you serve in that, that um, um, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, internship capacity, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, but I've never served in an associate ministry, but there's such a need for the pastors in that associate ministry for humility um, and, and deflecting to the aspect of saying, um, no, it's not about me, and, and to include all of the pastors in all of the conversations that are taking place in those situations. So there isn't this rivalry that, that develops. Yes, Evan? And then you, you kind of see something where it's like, you have, you have to And the, and the goal is, um, as, as Ephesians states, is that um, for the body of Christ to be built up under the leadership of his pastors um, so that many are doing the work and we all work together um, supporting the, the body, the, um, the ligaments, so that, that um, we're not torn away by every wind and, and cunning and craftiness of, of the devil. Um, yeah, and so gifts to be used. And, and I think that you could say, too, is, is there's always that aspect of, you know, this holds true for, for pastors. It holds true for spiritual leaders in the congregation. It holds true with in members of congregations. Um, is that there isn't this pedestal um, of, of any of those aspects. Well, um, I hang with this individual in the congregation, not so much with this individual in the congregation. Those things can happen too. Um, the Lord's desire, unity. Digging a little deeper, question A. For what specific things can we thank God 
regarding our own congregation, and you're not allowed to mention the pastor. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Touche. Touche. Rudy. Rudy. How does that apply to the question? Well, I, I won't have been here since 2008, but uh, as I think back at the things that have happened with the congregation, uh, he's, also, he's always been capable of uh, supplying us with the needs that we have. And, uh, um, won't disagree with you at, at any point in what you said there. Um, the idea of my question is maybe more focusing on the what is he supplying and what are those needs that he's supplying that we see as a strength of our congregation rather than just him fulfilling his promise because we know he will. Um, but where do we see him fulfilling that in a very tangible way amongst us? Sure. Uh, yep, the floor two times in a row. That's pretty good. Word and sacrament is faithful. Okay. Um, you know, a place where we have the opportunity for the word and sacrament. The Lord has allowed members to give generously that are outside of their members to fund programs and outreach. You do see the way in which um, strengths of the congregation of, of material blessings that, that we have. Evan. So the gifts of the gifts of the gifts of the um, instruments and the and the musical gifts, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think about I do know of I do know of congregations that are large, um, larger congregations who are having to use more of the electronic um, music because they don't have the the musical gifts and abilities. And we're blessed to have have um, you know three individuals who can play the, the organ. Um, you can even throw in a fourth one who plays, plays the piano um, well enough to be able to play in worship services as well. And then the musical gifts that are, are being used. Yeah. Um, I, I think too when I, when I asked this question and I thought of this question is, is, is the blessings of uh, the unity that we have amongst us. Um, you know, I, I just happened, you know, I oftentimes we'll look back at the, the bulletins that I put together for special services to see what we did most recently and then try to use maybe a different bulletin the next time. Um, and I happened across um, the Ascension Bulletin of 2020, um, which was the, the service before we resumed worship, because we resumed, we resumed worship um, on the first the, the, on Pentecost Sunday and and I, I, I looked back and I was reading all that was written in that bulletin and I'm, I'm just sitting there I'm saying I'm so glad we're not going through that anymore um, but I look at what was written and I think about our congregation and I heard about some other congregations and some of the the um, disunity and and the and really the, the animosity that grew amongst members because some were doing this and they, were, they felt that they were doing this too soon and others felt like, um, you know what, this isn't a big deal at all and, and the animosity. And I, I look at how the Lord in his grace, um, but a strength of the congregation brought us through um, still very united. Um, that's the strength of our congregation as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, that, that willingness to serve those capacities. And as we look at this, oh, go ahead. Absolutely, um, that, that spiritual support that is, that is there. Um, it is one of the blessings, and you know, it's, it's kind of those aspects of where we, we are at a time within our synod of where we have a very large shortage of pastors. Um, you know, I believe the number is 170 now. Um, and and so, so one of the things that is, is, is taking place and, and, and not, not unwisely, but it, it's consolidating sometimes some of your smaller locations, smaller congregations. But there are some huge blessings of not being a congregation of 700 or 1,000. Um, and, and that's one of them that you see much more. Not that it doesn't happen in larger congregations. And I think that in some regards, in larger congregations, it, it has to be even more intentional um, within them, it happens. But, boy, one of the blessings of when you have a smaller congregation, you can get to know one another even, even better. Um, let's look at question B there. In saying that he baptized few people, Paul is not dismissing or denying the importance of baptism. Paul speaks of baptism in lofty terms in other passages. Paul is merely making a distinction between the task he was called to do and the task others were called to do. This distinction might be made by the terms evangelism and nurture. How would you distinguish between evangelism and nurture? Go ahead, Evan. And I'll, I'm going I'm, I'm to stop you because your answer was good, but now don't give the example. Now go on to nurture. Nurture would be at the, the preserving and growing of faith rather than letting it wither and... I'm going to stop you there because, once again, you had a very nice answer. Um, and so that's not lost in, that, in, in, in what the examples that you give. So yeah, um, evangelism would be in that aspect of, as you rightfully said, that the planting of the seed, you know, that sharing of the gospel that's bringing somebody to faith. And nurturing um, is, is helping that faith to grow um, and staying connected to the word. So, so Paul is really saying, is, is the Lord has called me to go and just continue sharing this gospel, to proclaim this gospel, to be the one planting the seed as it grows, and then he would move on, right? Uh, he'd move on to the next congregation. He'd leave the leaders behind who would then do the nurturing. And understand, when it comes to this baptism aspect, too, is that for many of the individuals that he was coming into contact with, what, what is, what's taking place is that these are adult converts who, who then, after they've been brought to faith, um, are, are then being baptized. And, and probably then you would write, you, we'd say they're bringing their families to be baptized, like we see in the case of, of um, Paul and Silas in, in um, Philippi. And so what is he saying? He's saying that I've been called to do this. My associates, those other ones, can then baptize them. Um, as, as that takes place. And I can continue to share the gospel, share the gospel, this evangelism aspect. Um, here's the, the, the kind of the application question. How are you personally involved in each of these critical areas of your congregation's ministry? And, and maybe if, if instead of saying, how are you, is how would one, if, you did, if you're saying, how do I, how do I make this personal, um, maybe it's more, more of saying, how is one, um, personally, Annette?
Yeah, so the evangelism aspect really does take a, a, a role in the individual life of the Christian. Um, and, and so can the nurture, of course, too. But, but yeah, so, so individually... It is, um, and I, I was just thinking about that today of, you know, um, we received Gemma, um, you know, and, and we received Gemma as a result of um, Rick and Lisa being able to share with them, uh, share with her, you know, that aspect of saying, uh, would you like to speak to our pastor? Um, you know, next, no, excuse me, two weeks from now, we'll have opportunity to receive Holly Locke is her name, last name, is how you pronounce it, um, the one that's been here the last four, three, four weeks, um, friend of Elaine, um, and opportunity to, to meet, sit with her um, as a result of, of that. Um, you know, the ones that we have in, 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 mid in Wednesday Bible class, a uh, result of being invited um, by, by a member as well. So yeah, um, that aspect of, of uh, kind of come and see, right? Um, you, you mentioned before, Lisa, the aspect of um, kind of these ways that we are part of this this um, nurturing and evangelism, praying for each other, um, speaking to each other, um, being willing to give of ourselves to these formal programs that we have within our congregation for, for um, those words and actions um, as, we, as we go out, uh, giving ourselves to, to our, you know, assisting in the, the Christmas crafts for kids, um, participating in our in our um, Festival of Friendship Sundays, um, all those different aspects of you know, evangelism and nurture. Uh, and if you think about nurture, nurture really falls in line a lot with what, what we've tried to start with the whole idea of the, the mentoring, of nurturing that, that faith in that regard. Um, let's stop there. Instead of trying to, to stop in the middle of questions, we'll stop in the middle of, of the section of, of God's word that we're looking at. Um, any questions or comments, though, before we, we close? Rudy. Um, yes and no. So we, we see that when he came to Corinth um, with Aquila and Priscilla, um, they were tent makers, so he joined them. Um, and we hear about how at, at times um, he, he speaks to, to individuals about how he did not, um, in his words, burden the believers um, by having them supporting him. He supported himself. <coughs> But you will also notice that when um, his fellow associates came and joined him, no longer did he do that tent making, but he completely devoted himself to the preaching. So there's both, um, when we went through the book of Philippians, um, we hear about how he commended the Philippians because they were one of the few congregations that actually sent him financial support. So he wouldn't have to be doing that. So yes and no. Let's close with prayer. Lord Jesus, when you hung upon the cross, you received the full wrath of your Father for us and our sins. We have to admit, we haven't always been the family members you have called us to be, whether in our own personal families or in the family of believers within our congregation. But we know that because of your grace, we are now viewed by our Heavenly Father, as a perfect child, grant that your forgiveness will settle upon our loved ones and give us peace to our hearts as we journey toward our home in heaven. Amen.